the current commander of the Fighting Air Force Unit of Tactical Air Command at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base, the 4th Tactical Fighter Wing, is Colonel Charles E. Yeager. We're in Colonel Yeager's office now to talk with him about some of the things that brought him to this current position as commander of the 4th TAC Fighter Wing. Colonel Yeager, if it's not too many years to go back, uh, when did you originally get your start with the military? Well, Bob, uh, it really is a long time ago. Uh, I finished high school up in West Virginia in 1941, went straight into the Air Force as a GI, uh, typical GI, you might say. I was a mechanic on aircraft, uh, got promoted to PFC and corporal, and then I applied for pilot training in the fall of uh, 1941 and was accepted, uh, went into pilot training in, in fact, the summer of 42, and graduated in March 43 when I got my wings. And then I was assigned to a fighter outfit flying P-39s in Nevada and California. Uh, and finally, in November 43, we were sent to England to 8th Air Force and received Mustangs, p 51s And I flew uh, quite a few missions over there, well, up until March 5th, 44, and I got shot down, and that took me some four months to get back to England. I was shot down in occupied France, uh, evaded uh, with the help of the French underground or the Maquis through the Pyrenees Mountains into Spain, was interned in Spain because it was a neutral country and stayed there about three months. And then they turned me over to the British at Gibraltar and the British flew me back to England. And I finally got back, back with my squadron about July of 44 and then finally finished up uh, my missions in February of 45. I flew uh, some 270 hours of combat time. I shot down uh, 12 enemy aircraft, uh, hammered uh, five in one day uh, and four another day, and I shot down uh, one of the first German jets in September 44. Well, I came home then, uh, was assigned, assigned as an instructor down in Perrinfield, Texas for well, three or four months. Uh, might might say I did get married in February 44, or 45 when I came home, rather. Then. Uh, I went into flight test work at Wright Field in July of 45, and especially on the first jet aircraft. And we flew most of the aircraft that were captured, both German and Japanese, uh, that we brought back to the United States. And then I got in on the X-1 program in uh, 47, flew it, and then later on many of the first Delta Wing aircraft, the X-1A, uh, X-3, X-4, X-5, and many of the research programs for about nine straight years. Then I left Edwards in 1954, went to Germany and became commander of an F-86 squadron, the old 417th uh, Fighter Bomber Squadron. I stayed there for three years, then came back to George Air Force Base in uh, 57 and took over command of the first fighter day squadron in an F-100 outfit and spent three years there, then went to the Air War College uh, in 60 and graduated in 61, went back to Edwards for a five-year period as a commandant of the Aerospace Research Pilot School, our astronaut school that we have in the Air Force. Then after that, I uh, sent to the Philippines as commander of the 405th Fighter Wing. I had some five squadrons, and I kept about two squadrons, or the equivalent of two squadrons, in Vietnam and Thailand. I flew 126, 127 missions over there in B-57s and 100s. Then I came, uh, or was assigned as commander of the 4th TAC Fighter Wing here at Seymour Johnson, but uh, when I hit the West Coast, uh, I was spending a couple weeks leave out there prior to coming down, I got a call from TAC and said, uh, you may not have a wing when you get to Seymour, and I said, well, why? And they said, we can't tell you over the, over the phone, but I was aware of the Pueblo flap, so sure enough, when I got here, the 4th TAC fighter wing was gone, so I bundled up and caught it in Korea, so that's about the extent of it. Well, it sounds like you've really gone a long way uh, coming in as a, a boot, as it were, in the enlisted ranks and working through that end right on up through the flying experience. Sounds like you got, got a real liberal education on the countryside of Europe uh, during the time you were shot down and wandering through the countryside over there. Yeah, I met uh, a lot of people, uh, Bob. Uh, it was interesting because, uh, surprisingly enough, uh, we only associated with the very poor people in France uh, because they were the seemed to be the ones that were vitally interested in resisting the Germans. Uh, and these people were naturally of the farmer class, and it was real good uh, since I'd 
been raised on a farm as a boy to meet uh, the type of people that resisted the Germans. And I naturally got to know them quite well, uh, living and working with them and uh, sort of risking things the way they did. Uh, in fact, they risked everything just to help an American flyer get out of uh, either Germany or France. Then when you got back, uh, you must have found a little fury in that uh, walk. Uh, you became uh, what we'd call an ace in one day. Uh, this is sort of unusual in itself, isn't it? Five aircraft, one time? Yeah, I suppose so. Uh, I was leading a squadron that day, and uh, we happened to run upon uh, 22 uh, Focke 109s that were forming up to hit the bombers we were escorting. And uh, I, as luck would have it, came out of the sun and was behind them with the whole squadron I was leaving, leading, uh, some 16 Mustangs. And uh, we, uh, I think, shot down 18 of the uh, 20 one or 22 ME 109s, and we only lost one guy, and I got to happen to get five of the bunch. So. Sounds like quite a day. And uh, pitting an F-51 Mustang with uh, the new German jet, uh, did you really know how to fight the jet at the time you were pitted against it, or what did happen in that case? Well, we had received briefings on uh, the capabilities of the ME 262, and as it turned out, uh, uh, I actually ran into them. I had a flight of three with me in my flight, or a total of four of us. So we saw three of them. Uh, they were coming head on to us, and they were by and uh, out of sight before we knew what happened. Uh, we did recognize them, but uh, the way I got this guy, uh, they seemed to be uh, working around this one field up by Bremen, Germany, and uh, so we eased up there and stayed around some clouds, so finally we caught one on the final coming into land, and I hammered him. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to catch him had he not had his gear down, but, but because they uh, they ran around 500 to 550 miles an hour versus about 300 for a Mustang. Getting on into your later work in research and development, you became, as we understand it, the fastest man alive in being first to crack the sound barrier, and then again first to crack it going twice the speed of sound, for which... I believe in one instance you received the McKay Trophy, which is the trophy for outstanding contributions to aerospace. Yes, uh, I did uh, get, as I mentioned, involved with the X-1 in 1947. In fact, the 21st anniversary just occurred here last month. Uh, it was a, a real interesting program, and uh, there was a lot of unknowns involved. And uh, But when you go to test pilot school and train for this sort of thing, uh, you sort of expect anything in a program like that, but everything turned out real good, and uh, I flew the X-1 some 80-some uh, flights, uh, taking it up over a two-year period to about a 1,000 miles an hour, one and a half times the speed of sound, and then we finally retired it to the Smithsonian Institute, and then later on in 53, I flew the X-1A, another version of the X-1, out at some two and a half times the speed of sound, uh, just we were just doing normal research work. Uh, and those things come along. Uh, a lot of people talk about records. Well, you don't look at, at them as records yourself. It's just milestones or accomplishments that you uh, achieve uh, in doing uh, normal R&D work. Well, of course, getting up to the present day, Colonel Yeager, to the fourth wing, I understand there were some outstanding accomplishments in the wing. Of course, you had just newly arrived with it uh, over in the uh, Korean deployment due to the Pueblo crisis. And then, of course, uh, you accompanied the wing back to Seymour Johnson. What has been the program since then, and what is the program now with uh, keeping the fourth wing ready? Well, uh, you know, it actually, uh, the w the job that uh, I have in running the fourth attack fighter wing here now is it's quite simple. Uh, all we have to do is uh, assure that the fourth attack fighter wing remains ready to do exactly what it did when the Pueblo crisis came along. Uh, that's maintain a a status that we can react uh, within the prescribed time laid down on us by TAC and move out in an orderly manner anywhere in the world with our air crews and our equipment that we have to take along to support our flying and support our capability to, to fight a war when we land. And we do this by having exercises. Just recently, uh, some two weeks ago, we had our ORI, or Operationally Readiness Inspection, from TAC and we came out through with flying colors. Everybody did exactly what we were supposed to be able to do, you might say, but uh, then again, uh, there was no doubt in my mind because uh, we've got a tremendous number of professionals in the wing, and uh, in fact, it's the most powerful wing I've ever seen. Uh, the guys are dedicated uh, from the lowest-ranking airmen right up to uh, the pilots, 
and uh, I was extremely proud of them, and uh, I think uh, they maintain a combat readiness posture here in the wing that it's hard to beat anywhere in the world. Colonel Yeager, you say the simple thing is just maintaining this combat readiness, but actually the day-to-day -day grind, the routines, the training, isn't it some of the hardest work that some pilots do sometimes? Well, I, you can put it that way. Uh, you say hardest work. I, uh, I don't think the fellows uh, mind doing that sort of work. Uh, in fact, I think they enjoy it. Uh, our people that maintain the airplane, uh, we have to all perform a certain amount of training to keep the air crews uh, proficient in dive bombing, strafing, and being able to deliver their weapons systems. We also uh, have a certain standard that the airmen that work on the aircraft have to maintain. They have to have the capability of loading certain uh, ordnance uh, with a time limit. Uh, uh, the fellows have to perform a naturally a very high standard of maintenance uh, in order to keep from having accidents. And there's training records. Uh, there's many, many things to do. I'm a a, a poor man's city manager uh, when it comes to running a fighter wing because that's exactly what we have here on the base and it's a, a large complex organization as, as most of the people who've been out here have seen and it uh, our budget's quite large and it's getting so many more you've got to manage every penny and uh, we don't just fly airplanes there's a lot more than uh, meets the eye that goes on here. Well, Colonel Yeager, we know about the past, we know about the present. Uh, anything particular in the future for you and the fourth wing? I don't know uh, of anything uh, earth-shaking. Uh, I would say we will go on maintaining a combat readiness, and if there's a crisis develops anywhere in the world, we uh, more than likely would be sent to that area. Uh, in the meantime, we have, uh, we'll go down to Florida to fire uh, air-to-air missiles uh, to get that portion of our training out of the way. We'll probably still be putting on firepower dem demonstrations uh, throughout the United States. Uh, and we'll still go along filling blocks and training. And uh, at least I hope we don't get uh, involved in, in any kind of a crisis because this means uh, an escalation in world tension and uh, things uh, have been slacking off a little bit here, and I hope it uh, stays a little bit peaceful anyway. On the community side, when you've uh, had a little breather from all the training and the traveling you have to do and keeping up with things attack-wide and worldwide, I hope you've managed to enjoy a short stay here and again in the community of Goldsboro. Well, thank you, Bob. Uh, we have thoroughly enjoyed it. I like to hunt and fish very much, uh, and the caliber of people that we have met around Goldsboro and in North Carolina, they're just like everybody told us they'd be, just flat outstanding. And uh, we've got to know quite a few of them, and I hope uh, that's the reason I hate to deploy anywhere because it takes you away from uh, the people that you like to be around, and uh, I'm sure we'll go along enjoying a lot of the hospitality, and, and not only uh, taking a little hospitality, but giving too, because uh, we like for the people to come out and enjoy these things that they, they have to pay for, you know. Right. Colonel Yeager, it's been a very interesting talk with you. We've certainly enjoyed it and learning something about you and your background. We hope you have a very enjoyable, and if that should be your desire, link this day with us here in this area with the 4th Wing and at Seymour Johnson. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Colonel Charles E. Yeager, commander of the 4th Tactical Fighter Wing, Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. This is Bob Hill reporting.